today I wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the last line that we normally read through in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And that line is, for as often as you drink this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word proclaim itself is kata, kata angelo. And it means a it means a there you go an open and public declaration, which I find kind of interesting because most of the time we have communion we do where, you know the privacy of our own place right now like you know this is our own home with our four walls, and it's I, I I don't know exactly how this was necessarily portrayed or done in Corinth or any other place. Was it done in an open atmosphere? Was it like you know was did they have like an open air church and so they were doing this? Was that the normal cause or was the open and public declaration an idea more than it was a an actuality? In societies where you have an open and and, uh, and available public declaration of the Lord's death, speaking for Jesus Christ Himself, it can be very, very negative for you. You can mean open persecution. It can mean loss of some sort in regards to death or even a cast out of society to have an open and, um, and, and, and very public display of your belief in Jesus. I believe that if we were subject to that, we'd be more hesitant in having it more open and public, probably be very private, very closed, maybe in the house, closed doors, windows shut. I'm not exactly sure exa how we how the other world would take this as far as having this as an open and public declaration. Is this something you proclaim from the rooftops? However, we don't live in that society. And we should take advantage of that open and public declaration as often as we can. As far as remembrance, it is personal and sharing amongst fellow believers. As a proclamation is a statement to the world. The word proclamation is used 18 times in the New Testament and is different than teaching. So we can use this as a teaching moment for people who are believers. But as a proclamation, it is designed. That's why that's why I'm echoing. Um, it's designed to actually be a, uh, a pro proclamation to unbelievers. In Acts chapter 13, 38 through 39, it says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. This is speaking to unbelievers. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things, from which you could not be freed from the law of Moses. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul reiterates this. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, Proclaiming to you the testimony of God. He was its initial in indication of the introduction of Jesus Christ. Therefore, what we do now as, as, uni as a unified body is actually a public proclamation, even if there is no public to watch it. But we have to be cognizant of that. It's available for all to see. We're open. We can, anybody can partake. Anybody can watch us. We're not guarding the doors. We are to function as a visual witness, not just a spoken witness. Taking the cup and taking the bread is a visual representation to remember. And so this unspoken proclamation of the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins and salvation from hell is based upon his grace. We're representing that by what we do, not only by what we say. So let us pray that this opportunity is used to proclaim the wonderful substitutionary sacrificial atonement of Jesus to someone, either in this room or in our opportunity somewhere else very soon. Let's pray and we'll go ahead and uh, partake. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word that we are able to, to think it through, to study it, to understand it to the best of our ability. It's, it is a privilege and an honor to talk in front of other individuals, to proclaim to one another, to, to edify one another, and to, and, to, and to indicate to all around us of your truth. 
Help us to do so faithfully. In this time and all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Galatians, we are moving right along. We're in chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. Um, and so I'm trying to I kind of like try, kind of summarize better. Um, and so I, I, I basically looking at Galatians and ask myself, what has been established so far in chapter one through chapter three, verse 14? And I even wrote down in my notes, the ability to satisfy detail into one sentence is not an easy task, especially for me. All right. I. Give me one sentence. I'll create a compound sentence longer than most paragraphs. However, I did want to, I did kind of work this down. I kind of like, I, I, I created an entire paragraph of the detail and kind of kept on trying to whittle that down so that I can try to summarize what we have in Galatians so far. And here it is. In order to be justified by God initially and perpetually. Now, again, that perpetually is as a believer being right before God. It doesn't determine your location. See, I can't do it. <laughs> All right, I'll just read it again. If you've been following along, you know what I mean. All right. In order to be justified by God initially and perpetually, one must believe in Jesus apart from works of law. And of course, that brings us to the question. What about the Mosaic law? It's obviously there. You have the Ten Commandments. We all learned as a kid, you know, there's like, oh, I had the, the perfect ten. Yay. And if you keep these Ten Commandments, then what? Well, even as little kids, we don't. Now, now what? And we, we just try to we'll try harder. Really nail down those Ten Commandments. And it's it becomes obviously problematic because we begin to get programmed as a young age that God wants me to keep the commandments. Otherwise, he's not going to accept me. And so we have to address this head on. What do we say about the law? And fortunately, I don't have to come up with some type of conjecture. I don't have to make it up. I could just read the letters of Paul and he explains it fully for us. So let's go ahead and read Galatians 3, 15 through 29. That's our text for the next three weeks at least. Um, we'll see if it, if I can get it done in three weeks. I'm trying to take it paragraph by paragraph. And let's see what he has to say about the law. Beginning in verse 15, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it is ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law, the Mosaic law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law it is no longer based on a promise but god has granted it to abraham by means of a promise why the law then it was added because of transgressions having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made now a mediator is not for one party only whereas god is only one it is, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Make it a mind. May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we are kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. So that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized, identified into Christ, have clothed yourself 
with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So, what about the law? Paul anticipates this question. And over these next three paragraphs, you can look at it and say, what exactly is his main point? The first section, which we'll be dealing with today, deals with it from the, this first perspective. The law does not supplant a previous covenant. So you can't say, well, he made a promise to Abraham, and that promise was for perpetual for all time, but God changed the rules a little bit with the law. That's number one. Number two is the law provides guidance to lead us to faith in Jesus. Now, when we get there, it's important to understand that the Mosaic law, the, the, the perfect law given by God, had many different purposes. We're going to talk about the various different purposes within the law. However, for this purpose, justification by God alone, this is the purpose we're talking about, then the law is simply there to lead us to Christ. It is not there to save anybody. The law does not make a person righteous. In fact, it makes them unrighteous. More so. Why? Because the more we understand the law, the more we go, I don't do that. And just in case you think you can just, you know, live in a quiet room by yourself and just not do anything bad, there's also good things you're supposed to do in the law. Outward things that we don't do. There's sins of commission and there's sins of omission. And not only that, Jesus explains the law also was intended to be understood as a mental idea. So not committing adultery, that, that's good, don't. But you're also not supposed to think about committing adultery. So it's like, how do you keep up with this? You can't. That's the point. So therefore, it leads us to the need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. The law provides guidance to lead us to faith in Jesus. And number three, the law is rendered useless to those who are sons of God through faith in Jesus. So not only does it lead us to Jesus once we're in faith, why are you submitting back under something that was only intended to bring you somewhere? And you're there now. So... This brings us to our text, Galatians 3, 15 through 18. The law does not supplant the previous covenant. The section begins with, what's the first word you have in your Bible? Brethren. Now, I do want to take a little segue here to kind of help you understand how to read the book of Galatians with a little bit more efficiency. Because I was talking with someone earlier, uh, not today, but yesterday, and dealing with, with the written language. And how tone and um, inflection are, is difficult when reading. We put our own tenses in there. However, Galatians is probably the, the largest emotional roller coaster you'll ever be on. Over the last two and a half chapters, Paul is very upset. Would you agree? I mean, he is saying some pretty harsh things. I mean, he begins in, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, with you foolish Galatians, you ignorant Galatians, you unintelligent Galatians. I don't know if any of those different words soften the blow anymore. But he wasn't trying to, to, to insult them. He was bringing out a clarity that you don't know what you're talking about. You really don't know. But then we have this word brethren. And brethren is a very soft word. It is the word Adelphoi. And that's I, I kept it in its grammatical form because it's Adelphos in the in the in the what we call the uh, lexical entry. Like when you read a dictionary, you look up for the lex the dictionary entry. Adelphoi is the grammatical form. And I looked at this word and how it's used in Galatians. And how it's used is number one to redirect the, uh, the audience. Paul does this often in his books. He'll be over here and he'll say, brethren. And it kind of redirect the path a little bit, staying on topic most of the time, but kind of changing the subject a little bit. Well, obviously, that's what's happening here. But also, it's to regather attention with a term of endearment. 
We do this with our children, right? We have terms of endearment. So when we're talking to them kind of harshly, and it's kind of like that, that intense moment, we may go, son, look at me. Daughter, look at me. Still looking at me. Still not looking at me. She is. She's not. <laughs> And so you, you try to get their attention and, and get their focus on you again. And it's designed to kind of reconnect the relationship. Obviously, these people are saved. He wouldn't call them brethren. He'd be like, you lost, you know, sluggards. Why, what are you doing? They're saved. They're brethren. And he gets their attention. And so if you go through the book of Galatians, looking for the brethren, you'll be able to identify the ebb and flow of emotion. Have you ever just been so bent out of shape that you actually have to force yourself to calm down? And then it, as you continue talking, it ramps back up again. And then you'll, oh, okay, I'll bring it back down again. And then you keep on talking. Oh, and it keep, and because your emotion is so high that you actually have to force yourself to come down. The, 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 the high, the, the, the peak of passion, of anger is where you actually are and you're actually trying to force yourself down so as you don't come across as brutish. So one of the ways you can read the book of Galatians is in with respect to Paul's tone. Again, in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 1 and 2 are obviously high, high tone, high emotion there, but he's given more of a history. Then he directs himself. You, he doesn't call it... Brethren, who has bewitched you? He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You unlearned, ignorant Galatians, who has bewitched you? And he continues with this tone, reading it all the way through verse 14, giving them truth, but with high intensity. And then, boom, 15, changes his tone to that of a loving father with this loving approach. And if you read it, and he kind of goes, he kind of, he's, he's very soft. And then as he continues to go into chapter four, it's still kind of soft. And all of a sudden, it begins to get ramped up again. Look at verse 11. I fear that I have perhaps labored over you in vain. The intensity is creeping back up again. Verse 12. I beg of you, brethren, become as I am, for I also become as you are. You've done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was trial in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe me, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ himself. And he goes, and so he's begging them. He's pleading with them. We know each other. You, we know how we've functioned together. Even continuing on in verse 28, you can see it. Here we go. He's starting to build up. And you brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise, still trying to keep that tone low. In 431, he uses brethren again. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the free woman. And all of a sudden, the fire is set again. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject to a yoke of slavery again. And then he says, I testify to, again to every man who received circumcision. He's under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. And the tone increases and it becomes very harsh. And you can hear the anger in his voice. But then verse 11, brethren. Brethren. If I'm still preached circumcision, why am I persecuted? Brings it down in the tone. The summing, the summing block of the cross has been abolished. But then, I wish that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Well, that word mutilate is basically, if you want to cut off the tip, cut off the whole thing. That's not nice. The, 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 the ramping up of the emotion, the anger starting to present itself again. Then he tempers it down again. Brethren, you're called to freedom. Don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. And from here, he really kind of like, it's very doctrinal, very understanding about exactly what they need to do and exactly what their life is supposed to look like. And then he gives them a charge in chapter six, verse one, brethren, if anyone's caught in any trespass, 
you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And concludes the book very abruptly, but still with a loving tone. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. So high tone, first th two and a half, high emotion, anger, and then he starts to bring himself down and it kind of peaks up and then keeps goes his ebb and flow all the way till chapter chapter five in the middle. And then he kind of ends on this really soft notes while challenging them in how to live and how to continue along with their lives. I like reading it in the Greek because I can kind of like, instead of using brethren, which by the way, if you have an NASB 20, it says brothers and sisters. I don't mind that because again, we're not trying to be exclusive here. Brethren is kind of like mankind. People take that out of context, but it's a very simple term, right? And simply all you're trying to do there is just trying to bring home the content of basically everyone who is a saved person is within this group. So don't think that the, the Bible is being sexist when it says brethren. It's again, it's like mankind. But if you like the NASB 20, I suggest giving it a shot because it does start to break down where the, there's not a, a, a gender perspective there. But let's take this back to Galatians 3.15, understanding that he is now trying to bring it down a little bit, bring the tone down. He's not, he's not as fired up just at this point. And he says, I speak in terms of human relations to which, you know, like if you have a different translation, NIV, ESV, this is where like the, the idea of how they um, try to, to help you understand rather than give word for word content. Even the NASB, I'd rather the NASB give me the word for word content than try to help me out here because I think they just like confuse more people than anything else. What do you mean I speak in terms of human relations? even though it's only a man's covenant. I think that's more confusing than the literal. The literal and, and is basically, of, and I speak in terms of human relations, is I speak according to men. Now, if you could just understand that he's not speaking in accordance with God, he's speaking according to men. Let's go ahead and take what the New King James Version says. I speak after the manner of men or the, the, uh, the, the CSB, I am using a human illustration, the ESV to give a human example, the NIV to give an example from everyday life. Again, this, you know, kind of <laughs> stretches out quite a bit. But what are we doing here? Well, you're trying to take a phrase that says, I speak according to men and try to help people understand what that means. And I'll be honest with you, from the King James Version all the way through, I speak after the manner of men. I'm using a human illustration that all kind of hits because that's exactly what he's going to do. So I don't mind them trying to um, kind of what we call a dynamic translation to help us understand. But I think the NASB is going on like I think that does more confusion than anything else. That just, that just misses completely. So how do we know that he's going to use a human illustration, a hypothetical to draw out historical events from the Hebrew scriptures? Um, well, because he says so, even though it's only a man's covenant. Again, NASB, why do you do this? Because if you're talking about the law, people get confused. I've seen some commentaries that actually make this mistake because they're not exegetes. They're simply just commenting on what they think they read and they think the old testament covenant of the mosaic law is a man's covenant only and i'm like it's not what he's saying so don't like that so we, we take a look at this and i think if we're just slow and careful even in the nasb we'll be able to understand what he says but just in case you want to know exactly what is being stated here let's go ahead and pull up the blue letter bible free source able to read it easily and we'll be able to identify what we need to understand in accordance with language language is expressed in english in a very orderly way from left to right the dog ate his food and you could say and you have to put it in that order otherwise it doesn't make any sense Food, the dog, he ate. And you go, 
Well, what are you talking about? You know, you get confused because of the, of the word order. In Greek, word order doesn't matter because you are able to decline the nouns and add some, um, some, some, some uh, verbal expressions to be able to understand exactly who we're talking about. So if you look at this, Blur Bible does a good job color coordinating, by the way. You'll notice that the only nominative in this verse is no one, the N right there, nominative, singular, masculine. This is the subject of the sentence. Okay. He's direct addressing, brethren, I'm speaking in human in human terms, I'm speaking according to men. Okay. So if you were to put this in Greek word order, which the NASB kind of does, I think all it does is draw confusion because we don't talk like that. It, it, Yoda is easier to understand than sometimes the Greek word order. Here's it is in the Greek word order. Actually, I, I no, I'll go ahead and just have it like this. Similarly, of men having been confirmed, covenant, no one sets it aside or nor supplements. And you have to read it backwards and forwards four or five times to, to, for you to kind of figure out what's happening. So why not just put it in English word order and make it easier? Because once you do that, literal translation in English word order, duh. Okay. Similarly, no one sets aside or supplements a covenant of men when it has been confirmed. My translation. Isn't that much easier? I'm not saying that I'm better than NASB, but, you know, sometimes I think some of these translators kind of get all, uh, try to get all academic on you, you know, and use words that we know and use English word orders and when it becomes more prudent. Anyway, that's my, I'm off my soapbox. I'll be off. So a covenant is agree an agreement or a contract or a pact. We all understand that. And if men, basically what Paul is saying here is if men can understand that once a contract is in place, it is a violation to dismiss the contract or add other stipulations to it. If a contract is voided, somebody blew it, right? You didn't fulfill the contract. If you bought a car and you agreed to this percentage, and this amount of months, and this monthly payment, and all of a sudden the bank came back and said, you know what? We're going to add a couple percentage points. Thanks for playing. What would you do? I mean, first thing I would probably do is explode on the phone. You know, probably my phone would probably have to be replaced. It cost me more money. But then I'm, I might sue someone because they violated the contract. They upped my minimum payment. They upped my interest rates. I didn't do anything wrong. They're just changing the terms of my contract. Who can do that? Men know that that's wrong. If you agree to buy X or Y from somebody, and then all of a sudden, at the when, when you when they come and give it to you, okay, that'll be double the price. You go, well, no. <laughs> Everyone knows this. This is common knowledge. Everyone agrees that you cannot change an agreement once it's been confirmed, once the hand has been shook. Or in Hebrew terms, once the thigh has been grabbed. I don't know why they did that. So if men understand that once a contract is in place, that is a violation, how do you suppose God will view it? If God makes a deal and makes a promise, makes a covenant with someone, and they did nothing or could not do anything to violate that covenant, how do you think God will view that covenant as, as permanent as he is? Because he cannot violate his word. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, and he does not say unto seed as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Now, this verse has a few allusions to a few passages. Now, if you want to go over the seed, seeds, comment, I did that in Genesis a long time ago. I will give you my conclusion. The word seed in Hebrew is always singular. Context dictates on whether or not it's a singular idea or a plural idea. Paul here allows us to understand 
that even though at times the word seed can mean descendants, there are particular times in the Hebrew text where he is referring to one, descendant. And it's hard to read that in our Bibles because typically we just say seed is all the offspring. But let's go back to Genesis, if you will. I'm going to go to Genesis 13, 15, and 17 just to read a few passages and one in particular to help us understand exactly what's happening here in dealing with Abraham. Uh, obviously, we know Abraham uh, in, in the initial uh, promises made to Abraham in Genesis 12, but in Genesis 13, 14 through 15, um, through 17, actually, it says, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from place where you are, not northward and southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your seed forever. I will make your seed as the dust of the earth. So that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your seed can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land, the length and the breadth, for I will give it to you. In this passage, it begins with initial singular idea and then goes into the plurality of the descendants. In Genesis 15, verses 12, uh, I believe it's all the way through 21. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants, this is the plural concept, will be strangers in a land, at seed, by the way, but it's in the plural concept, will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation with whom they serve. And afterward, they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. It came about when the sun had set. It is very dark. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces which Abraham had set out earlier. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your, to your seed, I have given this land from the river of, of Egypt as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates, the Kenite, the Kesanite, the Ketamite, the Hittite, the Parasite, it's a joke, the Raphaim, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Gergesite, and the Jebusite. All those people will be gone, and your people will have it. Whose seed? Is that singular or plural? Ah, that's a tough one. I think it's singular. I think the descendant in, 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 in chapter 15, he refers to Jesus Christ himself there. You'll see why. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you through their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Here it's plural, interestingly enough. In verse 8, I will give you into your descendant or your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for our everlasting possession, I will be their God. Here we're talking about Israel in general. So here it's very interesting. The original promise surrendered about primarily what? The, the land. Because to be a nation, you had to have a land, a constitution, a king, okay? To be a nation. Now, if I told you, hey, Dan, I'm going to give you that house 400 years after you die. <laughs> He's going to go, thank you. <laughs> Why do I care? <laughs> I mean, these are people that, that my kids, 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 kids have not even thought of yet. Why do I care? So we look at that kind of promise and go, that didn't make any sense. Why would God make a promise to Abraham that would only come to fruition well after he's dead? How can God fulfill a promise to Abraham if he's dead and gone? How can he fulfill a promise to Israel after many thousands and millions are dead and gone? What's the solution? Resurrection. 
because we think this is end. See, if I told Dan, Dan, I'm going to give you that house 400 years from now, and don't worry, you're going to live in it 400 years from now. He goes, but I'm only going to live for another 40 years. How am I that supposed to happen? Resurrection. But how, how is the promise going to be fulfilled is the main question. This is where we don't get the nuance of the Old Testament in dealing with a term like seed. Because there must be one, because the seed promise does not originate with Abraham. Who does the seed promise originate with? The serpent and Adam and Eve. There will be a seed of the woman and a seed of the serpent. You will bruise his seed, his heel, and he, that seed, will bruise your head. That's where it originates from. And so we go through the seed promises and we'd be able to understand that, yes, there's going to be a large group of people that will be part of this inheritance. But there's going to be one focal point, one seed, and he will be the one who will bring life and resurrection. That's the idea here. That's the point. In fact, even Luke chapter one, verses 55 through 53 through 55 says he has, this is dealing with, this is Mary in the magnificent, magnificent, I don't like the term, but that's what everyone calls it. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich uh, empty handed. He has given help to his Israel, his servants in remembrance of his mercy. And he, as he spoke to his fathers, to Abraham and to his seed, singular. Now we're in the Greek where descendants can easily be plural. You can have seed in the plural very easily in Greek. How do I know that? Because Paul uses it in Galatians. And he does not say it's the seeds, but it's a seed. So Mary, in referring back to Abraham and to his seed forever, uses the singular. Mm. I love how this plays out. It is great. In Romans chapter 4, verse 13, Paul does the same thing. For the promise to Abraham or to his to his seed would be an heir of the world was not through law, but through the righteousness of faith. That's singular. And basically, here's the big kicker. Galatians 3.17. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. That seed promise... The promise of being in Abraham or a son of Abraham is given to everybody if they fulfill based upon faith. Again, something we've already been talking about. The promise made to Abraham and to his seed is not altered by the Mosaic law, not altered in one iota. It came 430 years later after the promise was made to Abraham. The promise is not made to Israel. Because this is Abraham, not directly to Israel. Israel, part of it, not directly. Remember, Israel is the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But being a son of Abraham is available to all families. In his descendant, in his seed, in his one, referring to Christ. And again, we read it already. But in case you're wondering, this is cleared up in, in Galatians 3, 26. For all, for you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized, identified into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. You are Abraham's seed. Heirs according to promise. Here's the kicker. And here's the difficulty. If the inheritance to Abraham was somehow shifted from promise to law, then God is a promise breaker. He is a liar. Because therefore he changed the conditions of the promise made to Abraham, which was an unconditional promise. It's already sealed. God walked through the, the, the pathway in Genesis 15. It's done. He cannot alter it. He made the promise. He cannot break it. In Galatians chapter 3, 18, 
For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. You can't have it both ways. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Some people say, well, it's both. What, it's, it's a promise to one group of people, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a law based upon other people. No. It's either promise or law. It cannot be both ways. There's other reasons to understand that, but simply the whole idea here is that we're taking into consideration what God had promised to Abraham already. What happens if the inheritance of Abraham is by law? What happens if you as an individual say, I understand that Jesus is God, but you know what? Jesus really wants me to obey the law so that I can become a child of Abraham. What happens? There we turn back to Romans 4, 13 through 14 and take a look at this a little bit more closely. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of law, it's not the law there, it's of law, any law, pick a law, pick one rule. If those who are of law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. If you want to sprinkle a tidbit of work, a tidbit of law with the grace of God, it nullifies the grace. It nullifies the promise. If it is by works, it is no longer of any grace. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So if those who inherit are based upon some rule, some work, something that one can point to, to say this is what I did to become part of the heirs, then faith is void, the promise is void. This is the difficulty. This is the harsh part. That if you don't believe in Jesus by grace alone and faith alone, that's it. If, if you believe it's by, by believing in Jesus and some form of work or effort, and I'm just adding a little bit there, that nullifies the promise according to the word of God. Meaning, in our terms, unsaved. Why? Because they've added a work to the grace of God of God. And God says, that's not my righteousness. I, you, 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 you brought your own righteousness to the game. Back to Galatians 3, 17 through 18. Now we observe in this context, if the law of Moses is now the means to be heirs of God and sons of Abraham, then the promise is nullified. God is a liar and we're all dead in our sins because we can't keep the law. If God changed the rules, and said, now it's going to be by law, by the Mosaic law, then we're all in trouble. Because we've already established that no one can keep the law. If the law replaces the promises made to Abraham, then it is an obvious violation and God is a liar. Good news is God is not a liar. He provides the promise to us in the same manner he did to Abraham. The law did not circumvent that. It doesn't matter if you were David or Solomon or Moses himself. You were not saved. You were not justified. You did not gain the promises of Abraham based upon that Mosaic law. That was for a different purpose. So the next question is obviously then what is the purpose of the law? I mean, it seems kind of superfluous at this point, doesn't it? If the promises to Abraham were always the promise of Abraham, why did God even do it? Why did God bring the law? Hopefully, if you follow me from all of our work so far, you already know the answer. But let's let Paul answer the question next class. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much for your word, that your promises remain solid, that eternality is bigger than our problems. Our circumstances do not negate who you are. Help us to always have eternity on our mind. Jesus, as our forethought, our focus clearly 
upon your promises so that regardless of our turmoil, we can have joy, not because of our circumstances, but because of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.